Good morning, all of you tuning in this morning with us. I am Dr. Jason Bolton, Vice President of Community Partnerships and Admissions for the Help Group, and I'll be moderating today's webcast, Absent Again, Strategies, Strategies to Improve School Attendance. Since August of 2020, we have been offering more, we've offered more than 20 webcasts that have covered a wide range of topics, including the mental health impact of the pandemic on our youth, the benefits of psychotherapy for autistic individuals, the intersection between autism spectrum disorder and LGBTQIA+, and COVID regression or learning disability. You can find each of those webcasts, as well as many more, and a virtual open house of all of our schools on our website at www.thehelpgroup.org slash webcasts. And that should have come up on your screen on the bottom left just now. For almost 50 years, the Help Group has provided high quality special education services to students in Los Angeles. While the importance of consistent attendance has always been an issue worth focusing on for all students, but especially for those in need of educational intervention and remediation, the need to address this issue has intensified significantly following our collective emergence from the restrictions of the COVID pandemic. In our schools, the daily rate of absenteeism has increased significantly since we returned to school in person across all of our schools. The phenomenon is not limited to our schools, but is being experienced in many schools and school districts across the country. The importance of school attendance has been studied extensively and the deleterious effects of chronic absenteeism and even more periodic but excessive absences has been shown on several outcomes, including grades and graduation rates. Additionally, while discussed less frequently, the larger, more systemic effect of worsening attendance is that fewer dollars flow to school districts, local schools, and special education programs when absenteeism rates increase. In California's current school funding model, schools receive funding only for days in which students are present. Therefore, the fewer students in attendance each day, the less money that goes to schools to support all school services and operations, including the provision of special education. It is easy to see that increasing absentee rates represent a true threat to the instruction and services all students require. Our presenters today will be saying a lot more about this topic. So now I would like to tell you about today's speakers who will lead us in this important discussion about improving school attendance. Diane Lativio joined the HELP Group in July 2022 as the Attendance and Retention Counselor for all the HELP Group schools and has recently taken on, the, taken on the role as director for the Kids Like Me after school and camp programs. She received her master's degree in counseling psychology from the University of San Francisco in 2007 and has since worked almost exclusively with children, youth, and families in a variety of nonprofits, including the YMCA of San Francisco, Catholic Charities, who strives to combat homelessness, inequity, aging and isolation, generational poverty, HIV AIDS, and immigration, to name a few, and the California Regional Center System, specifically at the Golden Gate and North LA offices. She joins a growing movement of concerned educators and policy changers regarding the escalating rate of chronic absenteeism in our nation's schools, and looks forward to sharing her knowledge and collaborating with our community to get students back in the classroom. Nicole Jorensen is the Director of School-Based Behavioral Services for the HELP Group. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist and attended UC Santa Barbara, where she received a bachelor's degree in psychology and then attended Pepperdine University for her MA in clinical psychology. She has worked with children with special needs for over 15 years, 13 of which have come in non-public school settings. She also co-teaches a graduate level course for educators through the UCLA Extension, focusing on building partnerships with learners and coaching de-escalation and conflict resolution. Monica Mungia has more than 18 years of experience in the field of human services. She is currently the IDEA specialist at North LA County Regional Center. She lets us know that you could also refer to her as an education specialist there, and she's the only one there, so you will find her there if you are looking for the educational specialist at North LA. 
She also has served as an adjunct faculty member at the College of the Canyons in the Early Childhood Education Department and earned a master's degree in special education from Cal State Northridge. In 2018, she received training in dispute resolution from Pepperdine University. She understands the value of interdisciplinary teams that collaborate to meet the needs of regional center centered children, youth, and their families, and the importance of empowering the communities to make a difference for all. Now that you've heard a bit about our presenters today, we would like to know a little bit about you. You will now see a short poll pop up on your screen. Please answer these questions so we know who is participating with us today. I'll give you a couple minutes. There's five questions here. Um, if you could just kindly uh, answer those and we'll know a little bit about who's with us today. We had about 200 registrations today, so I'm happy to see who, 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 who is here. Um, also, uh, when you are finished with your questions, you're going to have to go ahead and use that X button on the top right of the uh, window there uh, to exit out of the poll. Otherwise, that poll will stick up there and you won't be able to see our faces. So we're getting through here. A few people have answered. I'll wait until we get the majority and then I'll sort of recap where we are. We are getting there. We are getting there. Maybe a few more seconds here. Okay. I was waiting for that magic number of 85% of people having answered and we're at that at that point. You can keep answering, but I'm the, the, the percentage will stay about the same. So um uh Folks who have attended at least one of our previous webcasts, about a quarter of you, um, and uh, 75, three, three out of four of you are new. So thank you very much for joining us the first time. That's, that's great to have you here. And thank you for those of you who are returning to see us again. Um, we're wanting to know exactly who's in the audience. And um, we have about half of you that are mental health providers. Uh, we have uh, a couple of teachers and a handful of parents. And then, uh, and then about a third of you uh, are saying other, so uh, uh, not identifying as providers, teachers, or parents, but interested uh, community members. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I am concerned about the effects of increasing absenteeism on our students. I would hope that would be overwhelmingly yes, that's why you're here and that's what it shows up. Uh, and then there are a few people um, who are just learning about it and I'm happy to report that not a single person said is I'm not sure it's a, a, just a big, such a big issue. Um, uh, I have children, clients, family members, or friends who are experiencing difficulty consistently attending school. And again, the overwhelming majority um, are saying yes. There's only a couple folks who say no and others uh, uh, who are excited to learn how to help. So thank you for that. Uh, and then we asked this question. Um, we haven't asked it before, and we're uh, interested to know if we started um, offering in-person uh, education uh, uh, continuing education and lectures if folks would be interested. Uh, so uh, this is really good information for us to have. And um, we have about half of you who would be, um, uh, some that would uh, rather not, and some who are still about a little bit less than half that are making up their minds. So it's almost between a yes and folks who are making up their minds. So uh, thank you uh, very much for that. We're going to end the poll and then remember to uh, X out uh, so that you can see our faces. Okay, we are honored that you have chosen to spend another hour with us for those 25% and, and a new hour with us for those 75%. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the help group. Among other social and mental health services serving the entirety of LA County, uh, including outpatient mental health services and intensive family intervention programs, uh, Kaleidoscope and Lumina Counseling Center. The help group also operates 14 non-public schools in LA County for students with autism spectrum disorders, learning disabilities, ADHD, developmental delays, and emotional challenges. We contract with more than 80 local education authorities, school districts, charter schools, uh, who provide to provide special education and related services to more than a thousand students. During this presentation, you may use the chat function 
uh, to present questions you would like the panelists to address. Uh, in this presentation, the presenters uh, also plan to ask you to participate maybe in a couple of um, uh, polls or, or hand raising opportunities. So look for that as well. At the end, we will have a Q&A section uh, and we will attempt to answer as many of the questions that you guys have during that time from doing, this is actually our 21st webcast. So from doing several webcasts, we know that we will not be able to get to all your questions. Uh, so if there are some uh, uh, frequently asked ones that we don't get to or some particularly salient questions, we will follow up and eat with an email to all registrants uh, with answers to those questions that we weren't able to address. Um, we typically also have a few time, a few questions in the chat during the during the uh, presentation where people are asking, uh, would th will this recording be available? It will. Um, it is being recorded, and it will end up on the the website at that www.thehelpgroup.org/webcasts address, and you will be able to see this webcast in its entirety if you want to share with friends or if you want to review it again. Okay, enough of me. I now have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker this morning, Diane Lativio. Hi, everyone. My name is Diane Lativio. I'm the Attendance and Retention Counselor for the Help Group Schools. Um, and my primary role here is to monitor attendance trends, provide feedback to schools for systemic change, and help school teams create plans and structures to get a chronic absent student back into the classroom. So um, I know we just did a poll, but we're gonna do another one. And so I'd like to use that fun little button on the bottom that says show, uh, show of hands. Um, for our professionals here, how many of you are involved in contacting and searching for absent students? Just raise your hand. Very good. Quite a lot of you, okay. Now for our parents, how many of you have gotten a call from the school asking where your student is? Quite a few of you, good. Okay, now show of hands for everybody. How many of you are annoyed by doing the calls or getting calls about your student's absence? And that's okay, this is safe space. This is why we're here. Um, we're, that's why we're talking about it. We're, we're here to get our students back into school. And, um, Today, we're going to be talking about um, finding the root causes of not attending, um, some tips and tricks that both caregivers and school educators and school educators and professionals can use. And we're also talk about creating a lasting foundation of school positive positivity and support so that attendance becomes a regular thing. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about strategies that will hopefully inspire you, encourage you, maybe even challenge uh, your current way of thinking, uh, but know that all of the things that we talk about, they're worth trying out because as the saying goes, you miss every shot that you don't take. Um, also know that a lot of today's information and resources was compiled by Attendance Works which is a nonprofit initiative dedicated to reducing chronic absenteeism in our nation's schools. Uh, we have a few handouts that we um, obtained from that website and from that program, but you can certainly go and look at their um, information if you'd like. Next slide. Uh, so before I talk about anything else, I do want to express that this is a partnership, a coordinated, coordinated effort with you, uh, the parent, you, the educator, you, the professional. We are not in this alone, and this is not something that we can tackle alone. Secondly, we know that all of us have the best intentions for our students. It's clear that we have big dreams for them, and the choices that we sometimes make on their behalf is always made with the best of intentions. Thirdly, I want you to know that chronic absenteeism, which is a phrase I'm gonna be using a lot in this webcast, is very prevalent in this country, especially after the pandemic. Students with disabilities are even more affected as research indicated, it indicates that they are twice as likely uh, than typically developing peers to miss school. So if you are a parent here, or you're an educator here, a teacher here that 
uh, feel like you're the only one kind of struggling with this issue, please don't feel that way. There are so many parents and caregivers and educators and schools that are kind of going through the same thing. Um, and But because of this, uh, this is sort of good news, because it is sort of prevalent in this country, um, there is now a lot of research and studies and data that go into this. So with data comes research-based research -based strategies that are shown to work. Next slide. So here's the main question. How do I get my student to school? But I'd like you to reframe it in another way. What is the reason they don't want to go? So uh, has anyone here, you can show your hands or not. Anyone here uh, watched Fe uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off? I know that's a long, that's a movie from a long time ago. But I remember it because there's, it starts off with that iconic scene um, where the title character outlines how to pull off what's known as the ultimate sickie. Do you remember that? So he's hit, heating up the thermometer. He, the day, the night before, he's saying, oh, I've got a tummy ache. He's got a whole plan <laughs> set up. Um, and I bring this up because more often than not, your student will tell you that they're sick and that's why they don't want to go to school. And sometimes they say, I've got a tummy ache, my head hurts, so on and so forth. Now, sometimes that's true. Sometimes our kids are sick, but there are times when they're actually not, and that's just the generic reason that they defer to. So before we keep our students home, it's always important to see if there's another reason behind not attending school. Next slide. Most reasons fall under four categories, barriers, aversion, disengagement, and misconception. We're gonna talk about barriers first. Um, and th this is really about uh, physical barriers, mental barriers, or health-related barriers to attending school. This could look like a lack of transportation to school. It could mean a lack of access to tech, a student having unreliable housing situations may prevent them from attending school regularly, or maybe there's family responsibilities. Maybe they're an older sibling who has a younger sibling and they might be asked to stay at home that day to take care of that younger sibling. Um, mental barriers could look like past trauma. It doesn't have to be related to school. It could just be trauma in general. Maybe they have severe anxiety or depression, um, or maybe it's not even the student. Maybe there are mental health issues by the caregiver. Um, and then health barriers, of course, could be chronic illnesses, poor hygiene or poor nutrition that leads or exacerbates or sustains continued illnesses. All of these things can absolutely prevent a student from regularly attending school. So if for caregivers, uh, for educators, for professionals, if you know uh, if a student is in this particular situation, this is where partnerships with the school and other community organizations are vital. Um, the school can, can help you get connected to outside services and community organizations for help with financial situations, home services, and therapeutic interventions. Um, some schools, like the HELP group, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug the HELP group, uh, the, some schools provide transportation or uh, mileage reimbursement, if that's an issue. Um, if a family is experiencing, um, or at least is not, is having difficulty accessing laptops, um, did you know that Los Angeles libraries loan Chromebooks um, and hotspots at any of their libraries? Um, let me see. And um, one of our speakers, you'll you'll hear from her later today, Monica Mungia. Uh, she works for the North Los Angeles Regional Center, which is another resource that a lot of our families could use. Um, and I'll let her kind of talk more about that later, but know that that is an organization that's um, available. Um, but bottom line, if the root cause for a student not attending is a barrier, the best thing that can be done is to ask for help. We cannot help if we don't know. And believe it or not, it is a very common response. So parents don't feel embarrassed to ask for help. We want you to ask for help. Sometimes your teacher might be might have an inkling and they don't want to embarrass you. So maybe they're not suggesting it, but you know, it's it's important to sort of extend that handout. Next slide. 
The next second reason for non-attendance is aversion. Um, basically, this means the students dislike the school environment or the environment that they have at home is way better than the one that they have at school. So ask yourselves this, does your student have trouble making friends? Is your student struggling academically? Have they missed so much school that they have so much work to make up that it seems insurmountable? Or um, did you as parents or educators or caregivers or people close to your student, do you have a, a undiscovered personal aversion to school yourself? Maybe you didn't have the greatest experience with the school and are you unconsciously communicating that to your student? If your student is adverse to coming to school, it's really important to pinpoint what that exact reason is and then create a very individualized plan for them with clear goals, with consistent check-ins about progress and constant monitoring of the plan. So for example, I am, I'm working with a student right now, we'll call him, uh, we'll call him Jay. And uh, we've been working with him since October. Um, and our first meeting was, he wasn't opening up to us at all. We asked him why he wasn't coming to school. He said, I'd rather be at home. I'd rather skateboard. I'd rather play video games. Um, and when we kind of like talked about, well, it's important to go to school because then you can get a good job, you know, when you're adult. And he basically said, I'd rather be homeless. I'd rather work with McDonald's. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. So we kept at him and we, we definitely didn't see him for a long time. And recently he came back um, and he opened up to his um, BCBA. And um, we had kind of known this, but um, it wasn't until he said it where it kind of all clicked in. So uh, his grandfather was terminally ill and he was in hospice. And the only time that the student could see this grandfather was during the day. So he didn't wanna to go to school because he wanted to be home with his grandfather. Um, and uh, we kind of knew it because he kind of mentioned it, but we didn't really make the connection until recently when he opened up. And uh, he, and unfortunately the grandfather passed away and I think that's why he opened up a little bit more. But um, what the, the reason why he opened up and I is because when his grandfather passed away, his teacher sent him flowers, not to his parent, it was addressed to the student. And this and to the and the letter said, um, Dear Jay, we uh, we miss you. We know we're going through a tough time. We're here for you. And he told us that was the reason why he felt safe enough to come back to school and to open up about these things. So um, it's important that when we're talking to our students, again, the first reason usually isn't the right reason, but you have to create a space where they feel safe enough to be able to say those things and to know that there is going to be accepted in a very positive way. So as this, going back to the student, as the student is talking more, um, uh, he starts talking about, the, the BCBA starts talking about, okay, thank you for telling me this is great. What do you need to see at school so that you want to come back more? And so they created something called a student success plan, which you can find on the Attendance Works website. It's basically um, a plan where a, a, the student talks about why they're not coming to school and they come up with their own plan on getting them there. And it's all about control. So um, it's allowing him the space to say, this is what I need. And then uh, the school is honoring that as well. Um, so tackling aversion involves using stu student identified incentives, short term buy in and then working on those aversions slowly through constant reframing of the problem incentives does not need to mean it's monetary, it could just mean something that they enjoy doing so for this particular student he wants to play guitar, so he, we are allowing him to bring his guitar and playing it during lunch simple as that. Um, he also likes coding. So one of the things the school is doing is, in, is uh, talking about doing a coding club during a school session. It's very simple things that could be done easily. Um, so he's filling out this plan and they're, they're committing to it. And 
Right now it's working because the student has control over those plans. Um, I, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole Jorensen, Director of Behavioral Services at the Help Group. She's gonna be talking about more behavioral strategies to use in the moment when one is dealing with a student who is completely adverse to going to school. Thank you, Diane. Um, I'm Nicole Jorensen. I'm the Director of School-Based Behavioral Services. And one very big behavior that we deal with is students who don't want to come to school. And so when we're when a student is struggling with behavioral with behavioral refusal, we need to make home less rewarding than being at school, right? As Diane mentioned. So how do we do this? The first step is finding that reinforcer or incentive. It is the hardest and most important step in all of this is figuring out what that student likes. What are they into? What is motivating for them? We have to find something that is likely to increase that motivation. We do this by asking the student, by observing the student, by noticing what they, noticing what they like or what they request or what they gravitate towards. Once we know what we like, we can use that as the proverbial carrot to kind of dangle in front of them to help them get on board with attendance. So first we like to look at school-based reinforcers. We wanna look at reinforcers that are already available at school and highlight them for the student. This is where we'll need to get the whole team involved, parents, administrators, teachers, counselors, everybody. In a perfect world, all students are motivated by the desire to get good grades. That's the way this is supposed to work, right? Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't always work for all students. Often we need to look a little bit further and find alternative motivators. So for example, we have a student where we noticed that they were only coming to school on days where they had art classes. Turns out that this student was not interested in doing academics, but was willing to come to school and deal with having the academics if they were getting one hour of art class. So while we can't necessarily change the student's schedule and add art class into every day if they're only getting it once a week, we can look at other alternatives. We can um, look at providing the student with a long-term art project where they have a little bit of time to work on it every day. Or maybe that teacher can incorporate art into at least one subject's um, lesson that day, each day. And so that there, at least, there is still an art project at least once every single day. But which, however we do it, by committing to provide that student with time for art every single day, we were able to increase their attendance from one day a week to five days a week. That is huge and makes all the difference in the student's academic success. Um, so while we like to first look at what we can do with at school reinforcement, Sometimes there is nothing from school that's reinforcing enough to help us get the student back to school right now. Uh, as hard as we may try, sometimes we need to look outside of the school to the, to the home for reinforcers. Um, the team again needs to look at what will reinforce the student together. So, you know, maybe there's a special item that they can have only if they go to school. Um, another example is we had a student who was refusing to come to school and parents were willing to buy her this special doll that she really wanted, but she only got that school or that doll at school. So she, if she didn't go to school that day, she did not have any access to the, to the doll. She didn't get to see the doll. She only got the doll while on school campus. And then if she was able to attend all five days in the week, she was able to have access to the doll on the weekend as well. So having access to this preferred item helped increase her attendance in two ways. It worked as like a transitional object to offer her support and comfort while she was at school and as something from home that rewarded her for her attendance. So similarly, we find a lot of success with home-based behavior plans. So, um, Obviously, these look very different depending on the student, their age, their functioning level, the frequency which, with which the student is attending. Um, for example, if you have a student who's attending maybe three days a week and you want to provide a reinforcer, you, you might want to provide a reinforcer where they attend all five days to get that reinforcement or that reward rather than providing daily reinforcement. This is because Let's say you 
give them a dollar for every day they come to school. Now, I don't always love monetary reinforcements. They have, you know, a role too. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later, but this is just an example. So every day they come to school, they get $1. But that student might wake up one morning and be like, man, I that dollar is just not worth it. I would rather stay in my bed and not get $1 than get out of my bed right now. Like, um, they, you know, I know I've been saving for that video game that I really want, and I've been doing a really good job, and I've been going almost every day, but it's just not worth it today. I'm just not going to go. It's a, a dollar isn't worth it. However, if the behavior plan was based on a whole week's attendance and they get $5 at the end of the week, if they attend all five days, missing that one day might, they might think twice. They might have that thought, oh, I really don't want to get out of bed today, but if I don't get out of bed today, I'm not going to get $5 on Friday. So maybe it's, maybe it's worth it to get out of bed and attend school. Um, so now that the student may have the motive or that student may have the motivation to get out of bed for that bigger reward at the end of the week, or they didn't have it for that smaller reward at the end of every day. But conversely, you may have students, you know, a student that's only attending one day a week, the idea of having to attend all five days in order to get that reward is just too overwhelming for them right? They might not, they might wake up in the morning and be like, oh my God, I'm never going to make it to all five days. It's not even worth it to get out of bed today because I know one day this week, I'm not going to get it. And then I'm not going to get that reward. So for this student, your home-based behavior plan would need to allow them to earn daily rather than weekly. So you really have to take a look at, you know, it, take into account age, level of functioning, what they're currently able to manage, and then you come up with and work with your team and come up with that home-based behavior plan that can be effective for that particular student. Um, you may also want to put together a behavior chart so that there's a visual component for these. That can be really helpful. Um, some examples of, um, of effective home-based behavior uh, plans are, you know, in order to gain access to video games in the evening, they must attend school that day. But then if they don't attend school, they don't get any access to video games that night. Um, or uh, for every day that the student attends school, they receive one token. And then tokens can be, you know, tokens can be anything. It could be Monopoly money or stickers or check marks on a calendar or buttons in a jar. Um, and when they get 50 tokens, they get a bigger prize. And again, that prize can be anything. We're looking at what that reinforcer or that incentive is for that student. It could be a trip to Magic Mountain or a new outfit that they've been wanting or a play date with a friend they don't get to see very often. Um, you you want to make sure, though, that the reinforcers are not available at home. So if you allow them time on their video games as a reinforcer for going to school, but but they have unlimited access to video games at home all the time, then the reinforcer you chose isn't going to work because it's not going to motivate them because they get access to the video games anyway. Um, another example, if you're giving them an iPad as a reinforcer or time on their iPad as a reinforcer for attending school, you have to be prepared that they do not get that iPad if they don't go to school. Even if they did all their chores that night and you really want to reinforce them, you have to find something else. You cannot reinforce them with that iPad because that is the dedicated reinforcer for school. Same with, you know, even if you really just need, you know, as a parent, you really just need a break and you need them to be quiet because you need 15 minutes to get something done. You, it can't be the iPad that you give them. You have to keep it or keep it specific to that is the reinforcement for school. Um, you also want to make sure that you're not accidentally reinforcing being at home. Um, if on days that we that they stay home from school, they get to play on the iPad, they get to watch TV, they get to play video games, they get to eat all the food and snacks that they want and hang out with their most preferred person, you know, of course they don't want to go to school. It's our job to ensure that the reinforcers that are maintaining the behaviors are removed. So that means make, you know, it not only do we want to make school more appealing, but we want to make staying at home less appealing. 
this is not about punishing them. It's not about punishing them for staying home. It's about making school more attractive, home less attractive. If they're bored at home, being at school might still be boring, but at least maybe they can be bored with their friends. Or maybe being at home and being at school are equally boring, but uh, but they know that uh, they'll get that reinforcer if they go to school, whereas they won't get that reinforcer if they stay home. Um, so you want to make sure that we're laying the foundation, setting clear expectations, following through, being consistent. Work with your team to develop a plan to motivate your student that will work for everyone. Make sure your plan is concise, clear, and enforceable. Um, if the student doesn't know what the reward is or doesn't know what, how to get the reward, your plan's not going to work. If the reward isn't something that you can do, then it, it won't work. If you promise your child $5 a day, every day they go to school, that's $900 a year. That just isn't sustainable for most of us, right? So while money is a great motivator, after all, it's the main reason that we all go to work every day, right? And we get our paychecks and that's how we maintain that. But often it's not the best reinforcer if it's not something that's sustainable for you and your family. Um, I'm also going to talk about anxiety. So if you believe anxiety is the main factor of your student, uh, you or for your student staying out of school, you may need to use a bit of a different approach. But before we go into all that, I want to take a moment to say that anxiety can be a serious mental medical and mental health issue that needs to be treated as such. So while I'm giving tips and tricks for managing school based anxiety and behaviors, none of this should be in place of speaking with your students medical professionals for treatment for anxiety and anxiety related issues nicole just a little just a little reminder we're at 20 minutes left and i know we have to get back to diane and monica so um just just a just a time crunch morning okay i'm gonna i'm gonna get through anxiety and i think okay. the others will we can we can move on um so sorry um when so we want to when we have a, when we feel a student is not attending due to having anxiety around school related issues, our first step is to find the root of the anxiety. Is it about the social interaction? Is it about you know something that's going on the bus that's causing the anxiety? Is it related to academics? And then whatever the issue is, we want to address it, address it with a combination of skill building and exposure. So first, we need to build the skills necessary for them to combat the anxiety. Um, first would be coping skills for when they or first and right is by giving them the coping skills so that they if they feel anxious they know how to handle that so that would be you know teaching them deep breathing or positive self-talk helping them say replace their anxious thoughts with saying to themselves i can do this i'm going to be okay um whether they say it out loud or to themselves this can really help reduce those anxious feelings then we also need to have, make sure that they have the skills necessary to manage things they feel anxious about. If they're feeling anxious about social interactions, we need to teach them social skills. If they're having a conflict with a peer or a teacher, maybe we need to teach them some conflict res resolution skills or some self-advocacy skills. If they're having academic anxiety, maybe we need to help them with their executive functioning skills or, or again, on their self-advocacy skills. Um, once we've taught them those skills, then we need to slowly increase exposure. We may want to we want to break things up into manageable steps when it comes to anxiety, because the more you they avoid it, the more they're the scarier that thing makes it. Sorry, let me try that again. The more you avoid the thing that makes you anxious, the scarier it becomes to face it. You have to help your student break that cycle. So this means again meeting with your team figuring out how you can have manageable, enforceable ways that you can slowly expose the student. Um, so um, I'm gonna stop it there and um, go bring it back to Diane so she can keep going. Thank you, Nicole. Sorry, I was um, also trying to answer some questions in the chat. So Nicole, if you wanna tackle some of those questions, in the chat, um, I tried to do a little bit, but I defer to your expertise as well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, so moving along, uh, the third uh, reason why a student might not attend school is disengagement. And what this really means is they just really have absolutely no ties to the school. They don't see the point. Um, they don't feel connected. They don't, maybe school isn't useful to them because they don't have long-term plans. They don't plan on going to college, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so this one's a little bit hard because solutions to tackle this reason, um, they're all rooted in relationships. You can't force a student to suddenly like school. All you can do is build a foundation where they start to realize that themselves. And this is going to take some time. Uh, but there are things that parents, educators, caregivers, policyholders, anybody involved can start to do, can, can do to start to build that foundation at the school. The first one is speak positively about the school environment and set expectations for good habits and regular attendance. So the last thing that you want to do is you better get to school or you'll be punished. You'll better get to school or this will happen. You want to talk about, man, if you go to school today, you're going to see your friends. Oh, there's an exciting science class that's happening. Or, hey, there's going to be a field trip tomorrow. Can't wait for that. You really want to shift your language um, and your communication to be about school and, and the, th the great things that can come out of that. Um, some things also that you can do, um, this is more for educators and mental health professionals um, here today, um, is, to, is more intentional relationship building. Now I know that we do it all the time, but sometimes we don't know what we're doing, <laughs> or that we're doing it. And so uh, there is something called the two by 10. Uh, you can Google it if you like, it's two, X10. Um, and what this is, is it's two minutes a day, 10 days, straight days in a row, in which a teacher or an educator or a mental health professional or anybody at school intentionally checks in with a student. This is sim as simple as, hi, how are you? I'm really glad you made it today. Um, um, looking forward to seeing you in class, that sort of thing. The key here is intentionality and consistency because kids who are disengaged from school don't really have that consistency anywhere else in their lives. So let's let school be that thing for them. So if they know that day eight, that, that teacher is going to check in with them in the morning, that's, that's huge for them. Um, and it's really simple for anybody to do at school. Um, and it's especially easy to start and you can continue it past 10 days if you like, but it's a really easy way to start building relationship with a student. Um, next slide, please. Uh, for educators in the room, it's really important to assess your school climate. And I know it's hard because we've got a million other things to do. And the last thing we need to see is stuff that goes wrong, but it's super important to do. Um, I did not include it here, um, but you can always, uh, I'll make sure we get, a, I'll get you a link to the Attendance Works website, but there is a great self-assessment tool for schools that helps schools assess their, their school climate and pinpoint areas in need of improvement. So for example, one of the things I saw is, is there someone at the front door of school to greet every single student as they come in? Simple, intuitive, sometimes we don't have it, but it, it makes a big impact. So I invite educators and mental professional, health professionals on this uh, website to take a look at that tool, share it with your school and see if there are things that can be improved. Um, but the bottom line is this, if a student is engaged, disengaged from their school because of a lack of relationship with that school, the only way to build the, that's, that relationship is by attending. And I know that sounds like a catch-22. A student's not going to go because they're disengaged from school, but the only way they're going to be engaged in school is if they go. I, I totally get it. Um, uh, but sometimes for kids who are disengaged, we got to just kind of say, come on, come on by. This place is great. You got to trust that, that it's going to happen. Uh, next slide, please. And the last reason is misconception. And this is really speaking to every single person in this webcast. Um, so show, uh, remember when I said in the beginning, um, uh, when parents and educators, we make decisions on behalf of our students with the best of intentions, okay? So keep that in mind. So show of hands, and I'm gonna see who's gonna be raising their hand. 
Uh, let me just close the chat really quick so I can see everybody. Um, show of hands for all of us. How many of you thought there was a difference between excused absences and unexcused absences? Well, I saw a couple. All right. So many of you know there is a difference between excused absences and unexcused absences. Okay, show of hands. How many of you allowed your student to take a mental health day? Some of you, good. All right, okay, take your hands down. How many of you took trips during school time? Thank you for being honest, good. How many of you scheduled medical appointments during the school week and then let your students stay at home for the rest of the day? Exactly. <laughs> now it's not meant to, to make you feel bad, you know, because again, we do things with the best of intentions. If the students are overwhelmed and stressed, of course, let's stay home. I, you know, today was stressful because I was, I was anxious about this webcast. I wanted to take the day off, but I'm here, right? So part of the problem with our students not attending is our unconscious messaging to our kids. If we want our kids to take school seriously, we need to make it a priority. So vacations need to be scheduled off the of school time. Medical appointments, if you can't get on the weekend, we understand that, but any school time is better than no school time. So try and schedule them in the morning so they can come back in the afternoon or schedule them in the afternoon so you can come in the morning. Um, mental health days, great. I love it. That's fine. But also, you know, there are other ways to sort of get around it. That's sort of what the weekends are for. Diane, are you ready to wrap up and throw to Monica? I am also yeah. almost done. Almost done. Next okay. slide. Next slide. Um, the, could, I'll kind of skip a couple of these. Um, uh, the next one is uh, myth is one or two days doesn't affect learning. And this is true. Okay. So I'll br briefly go over this. 18 days in a, in a hundred day school year is considered chronic absence. That means they are at risk for not, um, not being impacted later on. So 18 days total. If you take two days each month off, you're already at chronic absence. So I want you to think about that, that um, being missing one or two days here might not seem like a lot, but when you take it as a whole, it's impactful. So um, what you can do, and I'll move to the next slide. Uh, let's just go to slide 12, if you could please. Absences in any form to any degree for any age has an impact. So one or two absences here does make an impact. Taking um, days off during school time does have an impact. And it's important for you to go into that mindset if we're, our kids are going to come back to school. Foundation, absolutely. Um, so uh, slide, uh, next slide, please. So how do you overcome this? Um, set clear expectations to your student about attendance. Track it. So if you have a, um, a calendar on your fridge, mark all the times that they're out and you can kind of see how much that will, um, over time, what that looks like. Have backup plans. So if you can't get your kids to school, have a backup plan ready so someone else can do it. Take vacation when school is out. Um, really discern if a child is ill. Um, I'll send a handout there. We have a nice handout that says like, if your child presents these symptoms, keep them at home. Um, if they do have to stay at home, make sure that you're doing makeup work so they're not totally missing everything. But most importantly, adjust your messaging. What are the benefits of going to school rather than the consequences of not attending? We want to say school is great. It's going to be impactful. You're going to meet friends. It's going to be A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> adjust your messaging. Um, and uh, next slide. So I'm sorry, Monica, I'm going as fast as I can, but now we're here to um, maintain, uh, uh, to, I'm introducing Monica Mungia from the North Los Angeles Regional Center. Uh, North Los Angeles Regional Center provides lifelong partnerships and planning to persons with de developmental disabilities. And I'm more than happy to introduce her and um, take it away, Monica. 
thank you, Diane, and thank you, you know, to the health group and Ms. Bolton for having me here today. I'm, I'm very happy to introduce myself in my role as IDEA specialist. IDEA stands for Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So this is a federal law that, you know, assists all our families, schools, service providers to make sure that children receive the services they need, you know, within the educational system. Now, the reason why I'm here today is because, um, you know, it's very important that we understand that when our children are having some issues with attendance, this is a collaborative process. We don't have to navigate this alone, just like, uh, you know, Diane mentioned, and we need to create a culture of prevention. If we know our child is having challenges with attendance, we don't have to wait until we get uh, these letters from the school district that basically say that, you know, we're gonna have to go to court to fight our case on why our child missed so many days of school and what for. So it's very important that you reach out to the support system that you have, not only at the school with your counselors and your you know, behavioral specialists like Nicole, but also that you reach out to the agencies that are serving your family and your child, your student. Your, if it's a young student, then also perhaps mental health providers that are already involved in his care. So with the regional center, and the reason why I'm here today is because in my role, I do assist families to find you know, services and supports that may be available to them to support their students. So if we know that it's an issue with getting the child ready to go to school, and this is happening in the home, right? Because the school is gonna take care of what happens at school. But if the, the, the reason why your child is not attending is because you are also having challenges with behaviors, with getting your, your student ready every morning, with getting him motivated, then perhaps that's something that through the regional center uh, services, we can assess. So the, the families that are here today, service providers, you probably know that there is 21 regional centers in the state of California. Uh, I do belong to the one from Northern Lake County Regional Center that serves uh, primarily the San Fernando Valley area, Northeast, Northwest of LAUSD, um, the Santa Clarita Valley, they have five districts there, and then also the Antelope Valley, you know, Lancaster, Palmdale, which is a very large area. They have 10 school districts over there. Uh, so I do work with the three areas and I do facilitate you know, services and supports for families. Now, as you know, if you're part of the regional center or you're familiar with our services, we can also provide supportive services for the families. So it's important that you reach out to the consumer services coordinator that is assigned to a specific student it doesn't matter if you're a service provider. I, I was very happy to see this morning that we have a lot of mental health providers participating today. So you can create that partnership to facilitate access also for your you know, clients. So if you know a student is having issues and the family hasn't connected with the regional center, you can either you know, obtain a consent to get in contact with the regional center service coordinator or uh, you know, advise the families to go that route so they can get an assessment of needs uh, and determine if the family needs more you know, respite services, perhaps personal assistance to get the child ready you know, for the daily routines, or maybe a co coordination and collaboration with other providers because regional center may not have also all the services with regards, let's say, to counseling, right? We need to reach out to the mental health agencies that are in the community. But I do believe uh, that interdisciplinary team meetings are very helpful. And sometimes, you know, the, the, the consumer services coordinator at your regional center can help you with, you know, setting up these meetings and making sure that everybody is in the same page and creates a plan for the student to be successful in accessing you know, school, which is so important. Um, so please, I, I included my information in the chat, something that is very important that you know, and that's why I'm very happy to be here. Uh, as of March of this year, the Department of Developmental Services mandated all regional centers in the state of California 
to create an IDEA a specialist position like mine. So uh, before, you know, we, we used to rely as regional centers in our stakeholders, you know, Disability Rights California, the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, family focused resource centers that could assist with, you know, sharing resources for families. But now BDS believes it's so important to have someone internally, you know, through the regional center system to support the families, the consumers, the service providers and this, you know, relationship that really has to be strengthened and, and more so now after the pandemic. So you will find an IDEA specialist now in every single regional center. I know some are still hiring for this position, but not the lake. you are close to our area or you live, uh, you know, within our catchment area. I, I am the person that can support you. So feel free to reach out with questions specific to regional center and I will be able to connect you, uh, you know, with your service coordinator and to address the specifics of your child's needs. But thank you to the health group. We are partners. Um, you know, I, I have worked through the IEP process with, with the team and I'm very happy that they are providing these resources to the community. I believe that Nicole and Diane both provided us with great information today. So ni nice nice to talk to you. And, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out after today's presentation. Thank you so much, Monica. We are so glad that the regional centers have IDA specialists on board now. Um, just like Diane and Nicole have said throughout this uh, this uh, webcast that it, you know, it takes a village and it's an interdisciplinary approach when kids have complex problems like attendance and it's great that we can uh, count on community partners like the regional center um, to be a part of that solution so it's not always falling just on the parent and the and the school whether it's ours or community schools uh, public schools out there so we uh, thank you personally and also to the regional centers in general uh, for realizing that priority and 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 taking action so um, I think that you and I will be talking more uh, in the uh, coming weeks. And so it's great to have been able to have you today. Um, also, thank you to Diane and Nicole. Um, you know, this is something we probably could have gone two or three hours on. Uh, and we'll have to think about that in the future if we want to talk a little bit more to the community uh, about uh, these issues. Um, we're not going to have time to take questions, but I did notice uh, Diane and Nicole really answering questions in the chat. So I think we actually did get to most of them. Um, and uh, if there are any that are left over that we need to get to, then uh, we will uh, answer those um, otherwise. So we have come to the end of our time today, and I want to thank Diane, Nicole, and Monica once again for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. Um, like I said before, this presentation is recorded, and we will let you know when it's available to view and share with your friends. Um, our next webcast uh, we'll address uh, next steps, children and people of all ages uh, who are newly diagnosed with autism can take. Um, it will broadcast live on February 27th at 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, and again, we will reach out to all of you uh, about that webcast as more details emerge. At the HELP Group, we always endeavor to provide the best education to our students and to impart what we have learned about best practices to parents, schools, and other communities. If you would like to learn more about our schools and programs, you may go to our website at www.thehelpgroup.org. You can email our admissions department with a clever uh, email address, admissions at thehelpgroup.org. Um, or if you'd rather call, you can call us at 877 nine four three five seven four seven again all of that would be available all those contacts will be available on the website that's sometimes the easiest thing to do thank you so much for joining us we appreciate your choosing to spend your valuable time with us we at the help group are here for you when you need us i want to close i've remind i've said this the last couple of webcasts i'm going to close again saying it again please hold on tight to the ones you you love and reach out to those with whom you've lost touch we need each other more than ever these days. Have a great rest of your day and hope to see you soon again.